Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, coming on to this session about the proposals, the proposals to revise the constitution. Um, this is a process which has been going on for about 14 months and the board uh, selected a, a committee in September last year so that they could do the detailed wor work on the constitution and make recommendations to the National Council and the board. And you'll see on this screen that uh, Genevieve Overell, who's an independent board director, uh, chaired the committee. Richard Kirk, I'm assuming you would know because he was the past president from 2017-18. The CEO, Julia Cambage, Barry Whitmore, the CFO and company secretary, and myself been working with the Institute for about nine months on a range of strategic issues. So I'm going to take you through um, what are essentially the frequently asked questions on the website, but I'll be able to give you more context as we talk our way through these issues. And as I say, at any point, if you want to ask me a question, please stop and do so. So in 2015, the National Council then of the Institute engaged Henry Bosch, who was one of the financial markets regulators, um, to write a report about the governance structure and practices of the Institute. And in 2016, a number of changes were made to the constitution that introduced a board and introduced uh, three independent directors of the eight, which I'll come back to later. Since that time, Joe Kirby uh, was commissioned to write a report and Judith Slocum, who was the interim CEO for six months uh, until Julia Cambage started in February 2019. Each of these three experts identified that reforming the constitution was a priority, that the, the current constitution was not in line with contemporary governance practice, there are some duplications, some errors, uh, a range of things that actually don't work in terms of the Corporations Act. And this is a time to actually have a modern contemporary document, uh, particularly in the difficult times that we live in. So February last year, uh, the Board and National Council endorsed the Slocum Report as a sort of action plan for a whole range of reforms to the organisation. Um, there's been a whole series of issues that the Board and National Council have considered over that period of time. And in November last year, they endorsed the scope of changes. Um, Minter Ellisons were hired as the external lawyers um, to give us legal advice. And the committee that I talked about at the beginning um, was given the task of making recommendations to the board and National Council. And of course, we use those three external reports as um, part of the analysis that we did. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion between board and National Council, which I'll go into in more detail as we get down into the, into the, the body of the discussion. Um, all the chapter councils have been briefed um, draft constitution is now up in both a clean and a track change version. Um, originally, we were trying to get all of this ready for an early May um, AGM because there was the National Conference and the Venice Biennale. Obviously, COVID-19 has changed all of those things and they're not going ahead. So we now have more time. Um, the, uh, their financial reporting doesn't need to happen till the end of July. So it certainly won't be May, which gives us more time now. You've got until Friday, April 24 to actually provide feedback. Uh, the Board and National Council wanted a preamble that recognised the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and uh, the newly established First Nations Advisory Group and Cultural Reference Panel came together and this was their first task. So I will leave you to read those words. They're on the, um, 
the website and the FAQs and I can send you this PowerPoint if you wish. So currently in the Constitution, it talks about the Institute being a charity and getting deductible gift recipient status, which means if someone donates, you get a tax, in, a tax deduction. Um, but to do that, the Institute had to run art and scientific libraries and museums. And that's not something that's being um, considered any longer. So uh, we're stripping out those issues in the constitution. So the principal purposes of the institute are there, advance architecture, advance education, culture, and social public welfare, welfare through architecture, advocate for the profession, and encourage education in architecture. Um, and I should also say that the Institute's foundation does have that DGR status. So there is still a vehicle whereby um, there are taxable um, donations that can be provided. How will the membership be affected? So contemporary membership organisations and um, when I was looking for best practice, I looked at a number of other membership organisations and the Australian Institute of Company De Directors probably had, I think, the best uh, constitution and they are obviously an important part of the governance structure and that's where board directors get trained and, you know, keep up to speed on the latest governance requirements. So, so what is normal now is that you have a framework in the constitution and you talk about who has what responsibilities and roles and powers, but then the fine detail actually goes in regulation. Um, we currently do have a range of regulations, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, so currently as part of the constitution, there's a schedule two, which is a table that talks about the type of membership, uh, post-nominals, whether they have post-nominals, whether they can vote at an AGM or an EGM, whether they receive the annual report and so on. And what we're planning on doing, assuming this passes, is that we'll put that schedule slightly reformed um, as a regulation under the new constitution. Um, there's been a lot of work trying to improve the member value, uh, reduce the complexity of the membership structure, address the fee structure. Um, but we, ca we, we can't do any more of those things. Well, you may already know that uh, it's possible to waive 50% of your fees for the next two quarters. That announcement was made on Friday night by the National President, Helen Lockhead. Um, so there's those kinds of things we're doing to address uh, the pandemic, but uh, the other issues will have to remain for a bit longer. Um, so, you know, in terms of being able to amend the constitution, it will just allow the institute to be more agile. Any changes uh, which would be made by regulation would be made by the board in consultation with National Council. Uh, and in case you didn't know, there are five National Councillors who are board directors and three independent directors, which again, I'll talk about shortly. So there's a predominance of architects and members and National Councillors who make up the board. Uh, currently, there's a Schedule 1 to the Constitution, which is a proxy form. Uh, what we're proposing is that you delete that and you just use the wording that's contemporary in the Corporations Act, because that does get changed from time to time. So it seems more appropriate that we, we follow the wording that is contemporary when we need to do a proxy form. Schedule 3 has disciplinary proceedings uh, outlined in it. Richard Kirk said that it, there was only one, this is where you set up a tribunal because a client has made a complaint about a member architect and their external project. Richard Kirk said that this had only been done once. It was expensive and onerous and the member architect was found not guilty. 
So we're proposing that the board, remembering that most of the board directors are national councillors and architects, can resolve any complaints. They decide what's an appropriate mechanism, mediator or committee or conciliator, um, and that the code of professional conduct, which currently exists, be reviewed work, by a working party approved by national council. Clarifying the roles of the board and national council. So again, if we go back to those three expert reports, pretty much, in fact, all of them said there are conflicting roles in the current constitution about how the board and national council work. Under the Corporations Act, the board has the ultimate responsibility for the organisation in terms of its strategic direction, its finances, delivering performance against the organisation's goals and objectives. And each board director has very particular... Oh, here's a question. Let me... Uh, thank you for the board bringing the 50%. Um, Thank you very much. Yes, uh, you know, the Institute has been looking very hard at how to, um, how to assist members. And um, I don't know if you've done any of the lean-ins that are being done on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But again, this is a way of uh, supporting members, giving them uh, knowledge. We've had a lawyer talking about contracts. Um, we've had someone else, or perhaps we're having someone else coming up who's going to talk about human resources issues. Um, and I guess it's also important that people feel that the Institute is there to back them up. So thank you for your comment. Um, so I was saying, you know, each board director uh, has the fiduciary re responsibilities to make appropriate decisions and discharge their duties with care and diligence, even if they delegate their powers. So under the current constitution, under clause 8.1, uh, it states that the National Council is an advisory body reporting to the board. And so what we've proposed in the revised constitution is to actually get those respective responsibilities sorted out um, in, in most instances, the board is consulting with National Council and the National Council is very well represented on the board. Um, the National Council retains its focus on the leadership of the profession, the advocacy, research priorities and innovation, and its advisory capacity to the board. Uh, at a recent board and National Council meeting, we were talking about the constitution and we were asked to set the National Council up with the same sort of charter and reporting structures as things like the Finance Audit and Risk Committee. So that's one of the things that we'll be working on. The National Council also continues to appoint the president-elect, the National Council directors, and determine director's fees and the terms for the SONA and the Imagine representatives on National Council. How will the board be changed? Um, the current composition of the board remains unchanged. So there'll be eight board directors, the three presidential positions, pres national president, national president-elect, immediate past president, and two national council directors, as I said, appointed by national council, and the three independent directors. We're also proposing a number of changes because when you think about high performing boards, there's always an issue about skill set, uh, diversity of experience, and the longevity of people's um, roles on the board and how you actually have a managed process to get, you know, this enough corporate memory on the board and enough new people coming in as you need to refresh. So um, currently the national president is also the chair of the board. So they've got a double role, which is quite um, onerous. And what 
the board and national council are proposing it, they actually have a chairperson appointed by the board for up to three years at a time with any director eligible to be the chairperson. And the intention is that you have someone leading the organisation for more, for more than a year because having to bring someone up to speed every year is difficult for the individual and difficult for the organisation. Um, currently, also there in the constitution, there's a sort of black letter law about a minimum of three male and three female directors. Um, and over the last year, the National Gender Equity Policy Committee has um, developed a policy which was approved by National Council earlier this year. And they have come up with a formula uh, which is 40, 40, 20, 40 female and male and 20 any gender to be applied across the activities of the Institute. Uh, with a commitment by the Institute to actually collect data and research and do regular reporting about the Institute and the profession. So we can see how that formula is being implemented. Currently, um, one of the three independent directors can be a member. And uh, what we're proposing is that none of the independent people are members. There are already five of the eight um, directors are architects and are members. And the researcher and literature around high perform performing boards actually talks about you need people from different backgrounds, different professions. In fact, the latest research on diversity, and I'm on a number of boards, is actually around how people actually make their decisions. So it's really important that you just don't have the same skill set sitting um, on the board. And the appointment of the independent directors would now be done by the board in consultation with National Council, instead of currently National Council doing that. As I talked earlier when I talked about high performing boards and the, and the chair, um, Currently, all of the directors are only on for one year terms, which, you know, is far too short. People need time to actually understand. Hang on a second. Uh, yes, there is a matrix of skills that make up the board. And in fact, um, there's some... Um, I'm not sure whether there was wording in the current constitution, but certainly in the revised constitution, there is very much a skills matrix and it talks about, you know, appointment of directors um, taking that skills matrix uh, and people and culture policy into account when they think about appointing somebody. So we're proposing three year terms for everybody. The presidential positions, the same person is on for three years, even though they move through each different position. So you would actually have, you know, a much more stable a number of board directors. Currently in the constitution, it says that a quorum is four um, directors. Three of them have to come from national council and one has to be an independent. Um, all the board directors have the same responsibilities. And what we're proposing is that we move to what is a contemporary governance uh, approach, which is a majority. Uh, and that's there's no delineation between directors. Uh, also in the current constitution, it says if there are less than six directors, the board can only act in an emergency. And we're proposing uh, a change which says, as long as the board has a quorum, it can exercise its powers um, and operate under the, this constitution, which again is contemporary governance practice. Um, we're looking at changing for the written resolutions between board meetings that now 75% of the directors entitled to vote would be approval rather than the current 100%. How will National Council be changed? Um, let me just answer your question. Uh, 
Yes, uh, yes, the um, board and National Council can use technology. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's been a number of recent meetings dealing with COVID-19 using Zoom. Um, and we did uh, quite a significant strategic planning piece by Zoom a um, couple of weeks ago. So yes, that, that, that unlike local councils, uh, the technology is able to be used in the current constitution as well as the proposed one. Um, there was a number of discussions at National Council and Board about having a, a greater number of people who could um, become the National President-elect or a National Council Director. So one of the proposals is that we increase the number of nationally elected national councillors from four to six, and that the National Council in consultation with the board may increase the number of nationally elected national councillors from time to time from a minimum of six. So if for some reason there was some big issue coming up and the national councillors felt they needed more nationally elected national councillors, there's a mechanism by which that can occur. Um, we're looking at increasing the term for nationally elected national councillors to three years with a maximum term of six years, which the six years is already in the constitution. And if someone has served six years, they need to wait three years before they can reapply. Again, that's in the current constitution. And um, in the current constitution, to put your hand up to be the national president elect, you have to be a life fellow or a fellow. And the national councillors felt that this was um, a bit onerous. So we've used some similar type of language, but lowered the number of uh, years of membership. So the national councillors will elect a national president elect who must be a member who has made a significant contribution to the profession and the institute beyond their architectural practice as determined by national council and has had a minimum of eight years of membership. Uh, and again, similarly to what we're proposing with the board, uh, a, a majority would just, uh, a, a quorum would be a majority, um, not delineating the particular types of national councillors, and that a written resolution would be 75%, not 100%. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the board in consultation with National Council would determine all of those membership issues, classes, qualifications for admission to each class, rights of each class, fees and the wording of the form. Um, it's proposed that the, mem the board would decide on whether to accept or reject membership applications and they would delegate that function to the CEO if the revised constitution is passed. Currently, National Council delegates that function to the CEO. There are no changes proposed for chapter councils. And as I said, I've briefed all the chapter councils and they haven't come back to me and said they wanted something changed. Um, currently, as part of the, the constitution, uh, the board can make uh, regulations, and there are a number in place, particularly around elections. Um, so the revised constitution, assuming it's passed at the 2020 AGM, would be uh, supplemented by a number of new regulations. Um, I talked about Schedule 2 being slightly changed, uh, which I'll talk about a bit in a minute. Um, and so the board would continue to have the power to make regulations and would do it in consultation with National Council. Currently, uh, the regulations are binding to all members and that would continue. So the proposed new regulations at this stage, and you know, this is probably not a, an entirely comprehensive list, but um, and these draft, a number of these draft regulations are on the website if you're interested to see the kind of details that they contain. 
So we've done, we've in one comprehensive document, we've done an eligibility for membership document, um, schedule, membership classes and voting rights, the reform schedule two. Um, currently, the code of professional conduct needs to be reviewed, as I talked about earlier. So that's there and that would have to be reviewed and then become uh, a regulation. There's a number of people and culture policies that will need to be reviewed and become regulation. The, gen the new gender equity policy would be a regulation. We need to develop a diversity and inclusion policy. And the current member behaviour policy would be reviewed with the passing of the revised constitution. Scar, excuse me, I'm just going to have a sip of water. Thank you. So um, obviously in changing the terms for directors, we need to have an appropriate set of transitional arrangements so that we stagger the terms so that you get into a proper cycle. And I'll just show you the diagram because I think that's easier um, with the diagram. So for the, the three presidential positions, that's status quo. That just keeps working the way it works. For the current National Council directors, there's two of them. One will get a two-year term and one will get a three-year term so that then there's a proper cycle for them being selected. And with the three independent directors, one will get a one-year term, one will get a two-year term and one will get a three-year term. And again, then you start having an appropriate cycle of managing the directors coming and going onto the board. Um, casual vacancies in, uh, in the proposed revised constitution, we're saying that if a director resigns, let's say they resign after a year, the person who fills that vacancy would stay for, the, for a two year term so that you would complete the original term that the director was supposed to fill. Um, and with the National Council, uh, nationally elected National Councillors, we've got two things we're doing. We're moving from four to six and we're increasing the term. So I'm going to show you that diagram because again, that just makes it easier. So um, for two of the currently nationally elected councillors, they get a one year extra term. The other two would get a two year extra term. And for the two new ones that would be elected, they would get a three year term. So again, you then set up a cycle where you have two of those positions um, coming every year. And that's my presentation.